This week's episode of EWA Radio is sponsored by the Collaborative for Student Success. EWA retains full editorial control over the content of this podcast. This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. And I'm public editor Kavitha Cardoza. Wait a second. Hold up, hold up. How can we both (laughs) be public editor? Super simple. You're taking a well-earned sabbatical for a professional fellowship, and I'm going to step in and host the podcast when you're gone. That is a great plan, and I cannot think of anybody whose capable hands and voice I would like this to be in than yours, Kavitha. When do we start? Well, how about right now? Right now? Okay. Ask me anything. So who's your all-time favorite education secretary? You you don't ask me something a little easier to answer? There's a question that's easier than that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Maybe I'm not ready to let go of the podcast range just yet. How about I ask you some questions so our listeners can learn a little bit more about who you are and what you have planned for the coming year? Okay. I am much more comfortable asking the questions, but okay. What do you want to know? Let's start with your education journalism origin story. Where did you grow up? So I was born in England. I grew up in India. And I came to do a master's degree at the University of Illinois, gosh, 22 years ago. What did your educational experiences, how did they shape you when you were growing up? How did they inform who you were? Oh, my gosh, huge influence. I went to a Catholic school and a Catholic college, but 99% of the kids were not, not Catholic. Just Catholic education was really revered in India. And so... It was very typical if you were going to a private school, you went to a Catholic school. My teachers were hugely influential. Again, the vast majority were not Catholic. And um, even now, years and years later, every time I go back to India to visit, I go and visit them. That's incredible. You've been in touch with your teachers for that long. Yeah, I can't tell you, Emily, the kind of pride of place teachers have in Indian society. It's not just about, you know, the academics. It really is about how they molded characters. I think that's so interesting because we talk about American system and certainly there are places that people have great pride in their teachers and they should, but it's not necessarily as ingrained in our culture or our society the way you may find it in some places abroad. Absolutely. I think in a lot of Asian cultures, I've heard from friends of mine from African countries, like it's very much like we really put teachers on a pedestal. Um, It's so funny because when I came for my master's degree here and, you know, when the professor entered the class and it was a pretty small class, I stood up to say like, good morning, professor. (laughs) Like everyone else was looking at me like, who is this weirdo? (laughs) I never made that mistake again. I bet the professor loved it. I think secretly they probably thought I was weird too, but (laughs) um, we just, we are still in touch as well. You've had to adjust to a lot coming to cover the American education system. Mm -hmm. When I arrived as a student, I didn't know what credits were. And in a way that's helped me, I think, because I never take anything for granted. I literally say, but what does this mean? And, And what does that mean? Like even basics, because I, I didn't go through the system. How did you wind up on the education beat? Gosh, I wish I had a better story for you, Emily. But honestly, it was I had. So everyone in the newsroom was general assignment when I came to WAMU Public Radio in Washington, D.C. And I had gone to cover a story. And meanwhile, they they had decided like, oh, we'll come up with beats and everyone could choose a beat. And of course, it being Washington, D.C., Almost everyone wanted politics or something as close to politics as possible. And when I came back, only the education beat was left. And so I got that. And you stuck with it. I love it. I love it. I mean, I think if I had been in the room, that's the beat I would have chosen. And I just think it's the only beat that combines so many other beats 
uh, policy, health, immigration, you know, I mean, there's just every everything. And yet I always feel the one thing I love about it is that anytime, you know, like as a reporter covering any beat, you sometimes get frustrated and you're like, why am I doing this? And, you know, nothing is changing or no one cares. All you need to do is go into a classroom and there's a very short through line to why you do what you do. Like you just have to look at any student and you know, and that to me is very, very gratifying. I don't need to think long and hard about why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's it's the students. What is the most challenging part of the education reporting job for you? I think sometimes that you see the same things come back over and over, like I've covered education in one form or another for for more than two decades. And you see a lot of the same issues coming, rising to the surface. And you think, oh, why can't we solve this? It's so frustrating. Also, I think turnover is very frustrating, especially at the district level when, you know, someone comes and they set their agenda and it takes a while for everyone to get by and and then they leave and someone else comes. And that is a lot of turmoil. So, So I think those are the two most challenging aspects. You've been covering education amid the pandemic. Is there something that you've learned to do during this process that maybe is something that you're going to keep in your journalist toolbox going forward? Yeah, it's not directly related to kind of interviewing or writing, but I think when I, so I used to go into a newsroom every day before the pandemic and, you know, I loved the noise and I loved meeting people and I loved the the kind of general chaos of the newsroom. But I think what I loved during the pandemic was I started taking like short breaks in between reporting or phone calls. I got a little puppy just before the, the pandemic and So we would go for little walks. And I kind of grew to love that, Emily. It takes about three to four minutes around the block. And, you know, I have time to kind of think, to reflect on the interview I've done, to prepare for the next interview. And I find myself even now uh, doing that, taking short breaks just to kind of either clear my head or think through something. That's a pretty healthy habit. It is. It wasn't meant to be. Um, it didn't start off as healthy. And But I have I found I love those quiet moments. You know, as public editor, you're going to be hosting the podcast, but you're also taking on responsibilities at EWA in supporting reporters, doing one-on-one support when they need help, overseeing things like our fellowship program, and of course, New to the Beat, which is for newer reporters. So what made you want to take this job? I think it was all that, Emily. I mean, I started, like I said, I knew nothing about education and we were a really small newsroom. I mean, at that time, I remember I had this fancy title, the Springfield Bureau Chief, when I started in Illinois. And I always tell, like when I speak to students, I always say, well, I had a really fancy title, but I was the bureau of just myself. (laughs) Um, (laughs) There there was no one else. Um, And so... All I know about education, I mean, apart from like doing interviews, but really thinking about it in a bigger sense, helping to elevate my work, being able to ask someone when I have had a question or, you know, concern, getting a fellowship, like all of that, my connection was EWA. I loved coming for the seminars every year. I would see a lot of the same staff. I would meet a lot of my very generous education colleagues from around the country who were so helpful. I feel like through my years as an ed reporter, like EWA was a constant. And so I am was just super grateful. And so I had just finished doing a fellowship myself. And when I came back, I was looking for something to do. And when I heard this was open, I thought, oh, this is wonderful. I would love to make a difference. I want to ask, is there something you've done that people might be surprised if they saw it on your resume? (laughs) You mean like a job? Yeah. (laughs) Well, I took a break after college and um, I went to England for a little over a year and I was working over there. Um, so I started off like wanting to get like what I would think of as a proper job. And then 
I realized like there were jobs you could get jobs in pubs. And so <laughs> I quickly switched gears and I got a job in a pub, which was awesome. Uh, I was 21. It was a lot of fun. And um, the owner of the pub used to make us, you know, whoever was working there, and I think we were four young people, we had to drink our tips. So we didn't get cash. I'm sure it was totally illegal. But, okay, um, okay. This sounds like a very unhealthy <laughs> habit. <laughs> <laughs> it was when you're 21, you do like really stupid things. And so we drank our tips. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about some big changes coming for both EWA and the EWA Radio podcast as public editor Kavitha Cardoza prepares to take on hosting duties. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And speaking of podcasting, join the Collaborative for Student Success this summer on the Route K-12 through podcast, where they travel the country showcasing the ways federal recovery funds are reshaping our schools. Hosted by Jim Cowan, the Collaborative's Executive Director, guests will include education commissioners, district superintendents, and other folks who can help figure out where and how the funds are flowing. Jim will hear from parents about their concerns, share some insights and information that could help improve education where you live, and hopefully have some fun along the way. Look for the Root K-12 Exploring Education Recovery Podcast wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts weekly. Okay, Emily, I'm done with the hot seat. Let's switch gears and hear what's next for you. All right. Where are you off to? Well, it's pretty exciting, actually. I'm going to be a Spencer Education Fellow at the Columbia Journalism School, and it's a specialized fellowship for uh, journalists who want to focus on an education-related research project for the duration of the academic year. What are you going to focus on? I'm going to be looking at the Department of Defense's K-12 schools, which serve about 67,000 children from military-connected families around the globe. So that's a pretty good-sized school system. It's about the size of Metro Nashville, Tennessee, but they're spread out in uh, pretty much every continent and, and multiple countries, as well as through the U.S., predominantly in southern states. So I'm going to be looking at challenges and opportunities from students from those military-connected families. I've always thought um, the DODIA system, as it's called, is so fascinating because, like you said, it educates so many children, but it often flies under the radar. It does fly under the radar. And when I first mentioned this, a lot of people think I'm talking about the children of diplomats who may be working at U.S. embassies abroad and going to international schools. But this is very, very different. These are American schools located either on American soil here in the States or on American military installations. And in a lot of ways, they're very, very similar to a typical U.S. school, the way they're laid out, the way the classes are structured. But they're very, very different in their attitude toward instruction, the way they train and prepare and support their teachers. And by many accounts, students who would otherwise be struggling in traditional American schools are doing very well in these campuses. I have like a ton more questions, but I guess I've got to wait till the end of the year. <laughs> you have to wait till the end of the year. I'll try to update you a little bit as the project's going on. I, I did want to say how grateful I am to EWA for helping me to take this opportunity. It's something that I've been writing about and reporting on um, since about 2014. And the opportunity to get into it really in depth has been a dream of mine. So I just want to say how much I appreciate my EWA community for supporting me. How did you become an education reporter, Emily? You know, I became an education reporter like you. I started out by covering um, all of the beats. When I went to journalism school in California, I then went to work for a small community newspaper and covered absolutely everything, fire, courts, uh, politics, the tech beat, um, and, and also schools and education. Uh, I had an opportunity to move to a bigger paper in Nevada to be their health reporter. I was their health reporter for a year when there was an opening on the school's beat, and they moved me over there. And I actually thought that I would stay there for maybe a year or two, like a lot of people did. But I was covering the fifth largest school system in the country, over 300,000 students, more than 300 schools. And every time I turned around, there was something else to learn, something else to explore. And it just stuck with me. And I resisted multiple attempts to move me to other beats. I fought them off like a tiger. And like you, I saw that 
there was no story that I wanted to cover on any other beat that I couldn't get there through an education route. So if I wanted to write about sports, I wanted to write about politics, mental health, uh, community engagement, juvenile justice, it all would find a way to my desk as an education reporter. We know this about the education beat, right? And if you ask other education reporters, like usually they they love it too. Why do you think the education beat doesn't get the respect it, it deserves? I mean, I feel like even during the presidential election, like it'll get like half a question or something. Whereas when I speak to people, like education is a huge issue. I think this is similar to the disconnect that we see when we see things like the National Gallup poll and people rate American education and they say that it gets a score of like, they'll give it a C minus grade, or maybe if they're lucky, they'll get a B minus. But then when you ask them how they feel about their local schools, they'll give them an A or an A minus. Even in things like handling of the pandemic, you found that community members were much more supportive of their local schools than they were of the sort of idea of American education as a whole. And I do think at the local level, a lot of people do appreciate their education reporters for bringing to light the things that they really want to know. So I do think it does get more respect locally than we realize or gets talked about. But I do think it is seen as as, as a lesser beat somehow, perhaps because People think of it as impacting just a specific group of individuals, that is students, maybe teachers, maybe parents, and not necessarily communities as a whole. And I I do think that's starting to change because especially with the pandemic, we saw how the entire economy was shut down when suddenly parents didn't have a safe place for their children to be during the day. So I have to hope that if there is a silver lining there, that that there is going to be a shift in some of that thinking about the role that education plays in our society. I was going to ask you whether you felt hopeful about education and education reporting, but it sounds like you do. I think you have to be hopeful or you got to get out of the job. Uh, Honestly, there's a lot of stuff to, to make us worried and concerned. But as education journalists, we have to be looking for where are the bright spots, where are the solutions, where are the the things that can be replicated that can help other people. And to see that that schools and teachers and students and families are, are really trying to make the best of what they have. And I agree with you, though, that the thing that gets frustrating or that makes us pessimistic is when we see these cycles. I mean, how many times have we gone to cover a meeting where the the latest silver bullet reading program has been introduced or the magic math digital pad that's going to get passed around? I mean, I I felt like that was one of the truest episodes of Abbott Elementary when they handed out what looked like, you know, cut rate iPads and that this is how you're going to track your students' performance and it's going to solve all of our problems. And by the end of the 30-minute episode, they were throwing them in the trash. Uh, You know, I I do think that that can be frustrating for people, but you have to keep at it. You have to keep looking for, you know, for those bright spots. Yeah. You know, I have to say one of the things we, I was listening in to last week's podcast with you, and it was so surprising when you were talking, we were talking about someone who investigated, I guess, their favorite teacher and found out he was like a predator. And you talked about how often you've covered this type of story. And, you know, administrations don't take responsibility. No, they don't. And and certainly in Nevada and other places where I'd reported on teacher predators, it's extremely disheartening to see the same pattern repeated over and over again. And I did think that that was an episode that every reporter should listen to, if for no other reason than to understand that even while these are relatively rare instances statistically, the way that districts are handling them, there's some constants there. And it's a constant of cover-up and, and denial. And really, if it wasn't for this local reporter pulling back the curtain, if it wasn't for this reporter who had gone to the school insisting and pushing, it's possible that this person, this predator, would still be in a classroom. And that's, that would be a tragedy. If you had a magic wand, like what would you change in education? Magic wand. Magic wands are wonderful. You know, reading to me is so essential and it makes me feel very sad that there are kids out there who don't know how wonderful reading can be and, and the world that it opens up. When I was little, I struggled to learn to read. I was in special education programs, and my mom had to go through training to learn how to help me at home with special workbooks and flashcards and tutoring. And eventually, I I did catch up, and I love to read. I can't imagine not being a voracious reader now. And I just, if I could wave a magic wand, it would be that 
every child that needs the kind of intensive support that I was lucky enough to get could get it. That's so true. I think I probably would have said the same thing, uh, Emily. What are you going to miss the most? About being public editor while I'm on leave? Yep. All right. What am I gonna, honestly, I think I'll miss the podcast. Definitely. I love talking to reporters and hearing the backstories to the reporting, what they're working on, what's coming next. I learned so much from those conversations. And it's just, it's amazing to me, some of the paths that people have taken to the education beat. And I also love going back and looking at the old episodes and seeing folks who are no longer on the education beat or are still in journalism and seeing how those experiences shaped and informed their paths as reporters and and how it helped them. And I just, I think that's really powerful. I'll miss working with the rookies in the New to the Beat program. They're an absolute joy. I mean, it's just an absolute adrenaline shot in the arm of positivity, working with the rookies and the the amazing mentor members that we have who serve as their coaches during the duration of the program. So those are probably the two biggies. Well, we'll definitely have you back on the podcast. That's very Um, generous of you, Kavisha. Thank you. (laughs) I am sure I will be texting you all the time, asking you questions. Um, I'm so glad we overlapped. You know, I can't imagine another job where I would overlap with a person who had the job. I feel that could be awkward, but it's just been such a joy to have you there where I can, you know, just chat with you online and ask uh, stuff. You're going to do just fine. And I I would encourage folks, if you have a story that you want to share and you are an education journalist or a journalist who's written a great education story or produced a podcast series, reach out to Kavitha. Kavitha, you want to tell them your email? It's kcardoza at ewa.org. I am on Twitter as well. You can find me anyway and I will reply. Uh, The public editor position really is here to serve journalists. And so anything you want for this year, I'll be there and then Emily comes back. That's right. I'll be back in June. And I'm really looking forward to the break to coming back smarter with some new skills and and new knowledge to help our members grow and improve their own work. And you can find me still on Twitter. I'm going to be tweeting very lightly, I hope. I'm taking a bit of a social media hiatus. That's my goal. We'll see how well I do. It could be like when I quit Diet Coke the first time, the 11th time, and the 19th time. Um, It did stick when I quit it the 23rd time. So, uh, you know, it's possible that I will actually be less on social media, but I'm at EWA Emily, and that's not going to change. Hopefully the transition will be seamless when Emily leaves and when Emily comes back. Emily, this is probably your last time in a while on the podcast, so I would love for you to have the last word. Uh, The last word, take good care of yourselves. Thank you very, very much for listening. It's been an absolute joy, and I, I look forward to seeing you on my return, and you're in wonderful hands with Kavitha. And that wraps up this episode of EWA Radio, which was sponsored by the Collaborative for Student Success. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For 75 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Take good care of yourselves and thank you for listening.